Good to see everybody this morning. I know we've got, uh, I know we have a big group that's out traveling. Our college and senior high kids are off on a camping trip and whitewater rafting. And I didn't hear if anybody drowned yesterday, so we'll take that as good news. Um, they all should be back tomorrow. But thanks for being here. Um, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn over to Romans chapter 12. We'll begin there again this morning. Um, we have been in a, uh, a study now for, for several weeks about this idea of, of abnormal Christianity, the idea that, that we have got to be different, we've got to be weird, and in some cases we even got to be deviant from the culture and from the world that we live in because we are called by God to be different. Um, this passage from Romans chapter 12, uh, we've, we've read it every week now, and I hope, I hope it's sinking in, but, but Paul tells us there that, that God expects of us something different. He tells us, don't be conformed to the world. Don't, don't be pressed into their mold, okay? Don't, don't accept what they say as truth, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect, God expects us, he demands of us as followers of him to not conform to the world, but to be transformed, changed. That's what we've been talking about. We've looked at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount specifically because his intent, I think, through this entire sermon is to get across to, to those who are listening to him that, that people in his kingdom have got to transformationally change. They've got to be different. And that change is not merely in action, but it's in attitude. It emanates from the heart. It comes from within. It's a change that takes place from the inside out. Okay? Now, as we began talking last week, and I think you all understand this, there is no area of our culture that we are called to be different than the world that is more prevalent and more damaging in our culture today than that of sexuality. It is just everywhere. And last week we took a really deep dive into what God's word had to say specifically about sexuality as it applied to gender identity, as it applied to marriage, adultery, fornication, those words that Jesus is going to use this morning as we get into Matthew chapter 5. Understanding that in Genesis chapter 2, God designed Human sexuality, he designed man and woman. He designed marriage to be between man and woman. He designed it all. And when he was done, he looked at it and said, it's good. What God designed and created is good. Don't forget that. But also don't forget, as we closed last week, we said that Jesus is going to take what we know about this and he's going to raise it to a higher level. He's going to even take it up a notch further than what these people were thinking. We looked at the prevailing thought of the day in regards to sexual sin. Some have do and, and argue that, that the Old Testament teachings of God are irrelevant in our modern times. That Jesus never addressed the issue of gender. He never addressed the issues of of sexuality. He didn't, never addressed the issues of homosexuality, bisexuality, transgender, any of that stuff. Jesus never talked about it. Matter of fact, I actually listened to a guy on Friday who said those very words. He said, I'm still waiting for somebody to show me in here where Jesus addressed any of this stuff. And he says, you know what? You can't find it because Jesus never addressed it. And, and sometimes we as Christians, when we get faced with that argument, well, Jesus never talked about that stuff. We, 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 we kind of sit back and we go, uh, 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 um, uh, okay. But the reality is he did. He did. If you've got your Bibles, go to John chapter one, verse one. I, I want to take just a minute before we get into the lesson to, to clear up this issue because it's so important in our world. There are so many people that believe that, well, Jesus didn't talk about it, so it doesn't matter. Or, or somehow Jesus has a different opinion about it than God has on it. In John chapter 1, verse 1, we read this, and then we're going to hit 14. In the beginning was the Word, Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
And now we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and full of truth. Now, this is going to be quick and to the point. All right. According to John 1, 1, and if you believe your Bible and you go to your Bible as the authority of, of Scripture, as the authority of God, then one of the things you have to take as authoritative is what John says. In the beginning, Jesus was God. And Jesus is God. Understand, you cannot separate Jesus from the Trinity. It's impossible. And if at any time you do, the Trinity ceases to be the Trinity. And understand, you and I don't have the power to dissolve the Trinity. We don't. No matter how much you may want to dissolve the Trinity to make it fit your particular platform or idea, you can't and I can't. What God has said about sexuality in the Old Testament, Jesus was there in 100% agreement to. Saying the very same words. As a matter of fact, John says he is the word, the logos. When God created marriage, Jesus was there. When God created sex, Jesus was there. When God defined gender, Jesus was there. When God condemned adultery, Jesus was there. When he condemned homosexuality, Jesus was there. When he condemned fornication, Jesus was there. When God condemned every other form of sexual perversion of his good and acceptable creation, Jesus was there. We have to understand that and we have to believe that. Jesus, when asked about marriage and divorce, in, 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 he hits it in Matthew chapter 5, but again in Matthew chapter 19. He takes these Pharisees all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. Which was the creative order that was established by God which is the same as being established by Jesus. You can't take one and not the other. Paul says it this way in Colossians chapter 2, For in him, Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. The Trinity's there. Paul will tell Titus, he actually calls Jesus God. He says, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gives him both titles. Why? Because they're the one and the same. So don't tell me that Jesus doesn't speak to human sexuality and perversions that man has made to God's creation. He's been speaking about it since Genesis chapter 1. It's there. Now, you may choose to ignore it, but that's on you. Don't tell me Jesus doesn't address it. God, Jesus, through the Spirit, has been speaking to us about sexuality from the very beginning. And from the very beginning, and you need to hear this, from the very beginning, God looked at it and he saw it and he said sexuality that is created by God who looks at it and declares it to be good as he created it, as he designed it, as he intended it. Anything else is not good. Anything else is sinful. Can't be any plainer. Anything else. However, on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to notice that sexuality can and often does go wrong. And in our culture today, not only has it gone wrong, it has gone badly wrong. As we've been discussing, Jesus is contrasting the existing religious interpretation of the law of the day with his own intent of the law, which is transformation. The law was given to change us, to change Israel, to change people. That was its intent. It wasn't about actions that had to be kept. It was about attitudes that needed to be transformed. So if you've got your Bibles, let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Let's hear Jesus this morning on on this topic. Matthew chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin... Tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members and your whole body be thrown into hell. 
And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Jesus is clear. And he's addressing issues that were prevalent in the day, issues that are prevalent in our day as well. And we need to hear what he says. Not only hear what he says about what he expects us to do, but we need to hear what he says about who he expects us to be, which are two different things. Now, right off the bat, Jesus makes this, this statement in verse 28. I say to you that whoever looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, in our present culture, a statement like that has to make one wonder if there's anyone out there who hasn't been an adulterer at one point in time in their life. I mean, with a, with a, with a, with a myriad of, of, of garbage that's out there that's thrown up in our faces every single day, there's people that ask, well, if I've lusted, then I've already committed adultery, so I'm doomed. We have to understand, first of all, what that word lust means, what it implies. Lust, the, the epithemia, is defined simply as strong desire. And it's neither positive nor negative in its, in its, in its wording. It, it's what the desire is of that makes it either good or bad. Okay? Is it wrong to have a strong desire? Well, it depends on what you're desiring. Now, I will say this, there's only three times in the New Testament that this word is used in a positive way. Every other time it's mentioned, it's mentioned in a negative way. In Luke chapter 22, Luke records Jesus, he has this strong desire to eat the Passover meal with his disciples. It's the exact same word. He has a strong desire to, to eat that with them. Uh, it's described as, as Paul's desire to depart and go be with the Lord. Remember that from, from Philippians chapter 1. I had this strong desire to, to go be with the Lord, but, but yet I remain. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 2, Paul describes his strong desire to go be with the church at Thessalonica. His imprisonment's keeping him from it, but he has this strong desire. Okay? So it can be a positive thing. But understand, most of the time, this word, when it's used, is talking about a strong desire in a sexual way, in a way that is impure, in a way that, that, that leads to the gratification of the flesh. And it's always condemned. Always so Jesus identifies this, this trait that is within his culture. And he says, you know what? This is a bad thing. And, and it's such a bad thing. I, I want you to take some, some really extraordinary measures to make sure it doesn't happen in your life, to make sure it's not a part of your life. Listen to what he says in verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than the, your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. Well, what's he talking about? Well, from an English or from a literary standpoint, this is hyperbole. It's, it's, a, it's a gross exaggeration, right? I mean, Jesus doesn't literally intend for us to go out and start poking our eyes out or cutting our hands off, okay? But what he is saying is, you need to be ready to take extreme measures to protect yourselves from this because it is so destructive. He's simply saying, if you look at a woman or a man for the purpose of lusting, you're already committed adultery. So take extreme measures to stay away from places and to stay out of situations where you might find yourself doing that. And this goes right to the very heart of the matter. See, there's a very deep sin that's attached to lust. And I'll go ahead, go ahead here and include it. It's pornography. And it's so prevalent in our world. And I'll be honest with you, we don't like to talk about it, especially in church. But we have to. But we have to. Because within it is this idea that I will use this person as simply an object of my desire. And it is the ultimate selfish act. The other person doesn't have value at all. 
except as a means to fulfill our own desires. And that objectification of another person is a violation of their fundamental dignity. Dignity given them as a creation of God himself. That's why Jesus says there is absolutely no room in the heart of a disciple for this kind of of attitude. And he says, yes, you will have to take extreme measures to keep it out of your heart, especially in our society today. Jesus is telling us about the quality of our hearts and what we have to do to protect that quality. He's warning us about objectifying another person. He wants us to see people with worth and with dignity, not as simply a means to an end. Beyond our own needs, beyond our own wants. That is why lust, that's why pornography are so sinister. And I want you to see something piled right on behind this discussion of lust and adultery. Jesus says a few words about divorce and marriage. Because the two are deeply related. He's not going from one topic and now I'll go over here and talk about this topic for a while and then back to this topic. No, they're connected. They're connected He says in 31 and 32, it was also said, in other words, you guys have understood it before, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say, in other words, let me elevate that a little bit. But I say, whoever divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. He goes on to say that what holds two people together is so sacred, is so important that if you divide it up, To destroy this covenantal relationship is tantamount to committing this fundamental and monumental sin. He says, don't do it. And hear me, church, in a world of throwaway and and disposable marriages, his words ought to ring hard in our ears. He He says, getting a divorce unless sexual immorality has taken place in the marriage is sinful. And I know, I know. I know some of you have been touched by this. And I'm not here in judgment. I'm not here to stand in judgment of you. Okay? And maybe that's part of the reason why we don't want to talk about it. Because we've got so many who've been affected by it. And we don't want to offend anybody. But the reality is when we don't talk about it and we ignore it, then, then it becomes commonplace and we don't, we don't think about it. But I, I want these young kids to understand that marriage is very important. It's, it's one of the highest elements that God has designed and he wants what's absolutely best and perfect for you and he wants your marriages to last into eternity he wants you to wants you till death do his part means something it's not till I get tired of them it's not till they no longer satisfy my needs it's now it's not till they no longer look the way I want them to look and then I'll go find something else that meets my needs No, it's a commitment. It's a covenantal relationship. And Jesus holds it in high regard. God holds it in high regard. Why? Because he created it. It's his creation. When you get married, you're actually taking part in the creative act of God. Think about that for a minute. In Genesis chapter 2, he brings man and woman together. And when you come together, husband and wife, you are participating in the very creation, the creation act of God. Who are we to tear that apart? Now, on another thought, who are we to redefine what God has already defined? Either. We are not. We cannot. As a matter of fact, God defines it. He defines marriage very clearly. Genesis 2, between a man and a woman. Anything other than that is not even marriage by definition. You can call it whatever you want. But according to God, it's not marriage. Okay? Okay? This is important and it's important for us because the world comes flooding in from so many different ways and it tempts us in so many different ways. The the scripture reading that was up there this morning, God provides us a way out of that temptation, but we have to be looking for it. We have to be expecting it. But at the same time, we also have to be very careful not to put our places in situations where we know that temptation can and will and does occur. Yes, there are certain places you don't need to go. There are certain things you don't need to watch. There are certain people you don't need to hang around with. There are certain people you don't need to be in relationship with because it could be damning to your soul. And it might be fun 
for a while. But Jesus says, you know what? You'd be better off pulling your eye out or cutting your hand off than going to hell. Do we have that idea in our head about how serious sin is to God? You know, this whole idea of lust as it plays into our relationship with marriage. The two are intricately tied because lust is simply this idea that, you know what, I'm going to use you for whatever I need or want at the time. And part of our problems with marriages today is, is marriages end up being simply about getting what we want out of a spouse. And when they can no longer get it out of a spouse, they go looking somewhere else. I can't tell you how many marriage counseling sessions I've sat in with couples or, or with individuals. And one of the things that comes out of their mouth most often is, well, they, are, they just aren't meeting my needs. And my first question back is usually, well, how well are you satisfying their needs? You see, lust plays into this because it seeks to objectify somebody else simply as an object through which I can get what I want. Sheldon Van Auken, <laughs> he was a contemporary of C.S. Lewis. He said this, when you get a new car, you should also go get a hammer and take the hammer and go out and put the first dent in the brand new car yourself. I told Sean to do this when he came pulling in with that truck. I said, go get your hammer. Yeah. He said, then you're not afraid to use it anymore. You don't have to park at the end of the parking lot to protect it from door dings because you've already put the first den in it yourself. Van Auken's point was simply this. Things are not to be loved. Things are to be used. Okay, the corollary to this thought, though, is simply this. People are not to be used. They are to be loved. And in our culture today, we have flipped the two around. We love our things and we use people. We use people for whatever they can give to us. And I, I tell you what, if there's, a, if there's a thought permeating culture today that I could rip out and just throw away, it's this idea of selfishness. Because so many people today think they are the very center of the universe and everyone else in the world exists to satisfy their needs. And the problem is, it, 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 relationally, if I get into a relation with someone and all of a sudden you don't meet my need, guess what? I'm moving on. I'm going to go find somebody who will meet my needs. How does that translate into marriage? How does that translate into any relationship? You wonder why it's so difficult now, relationally? It's because we are so selfish. We think the world revolves around us. And all we can think about is what can they do for me? What can they give me? But it isn't about that. Jesus asked us, what would happen if we took seriously the fact that things are to be used and not loved and people are to be loved and not used? And this whole idea of lust is simply that. It's this idea of using somebody else to satisfy me simply as an object. You know, I'm grateful for when I grew up. You know, pornography was available, but it was hard to get. I remember. You had to go into the 7-Eleven. It was back behind the counter. It was in a brown paper uh, thing. I used to work at the 7-Eleven. I can tell you what would happen. We'd have guys come in, and they'd stand around, and they'd wait until nobody else was in the store. And then as soon as nobody else was in the store, they'd run up and say, you know what, yeah, yeah, give me that magazine. Right? And it was almost like they were buying something illegal. And I pray for the days when it was that difficult to get. Because today, today, it's available at the push of a link on the internet. It's on any computer. It's on your iPhone. It's on your tablet. It's on almost every video platform, probably on your TV. It's on Netflix. It's on Amazon. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And it's anonymous. It's anonymous. 
And we as a church can no longer simply pretend it doesn't exist and that it doesn't affect us because it does. And the ramifications to relationships, especially to marriages, is devastating. And let me just say this, church. There, there, are, there are psychologists, there are marriage therapists out there, and I will just, I'll be the first to tell you, if they are prescribing pornography as a marital aid, they are quacks. Okay? Okay. Yeah, I said it, and and if you know one and I just offended them, have them come talk to me. They are quacks. There is nothing more destructive to your marriage. There's nothing more destructive to your future relationships than this garbage. There's nothing more destructive to the objectified women who are abused to produce this stuff. I want to shock you for a minute. I, I had to call Dana several times this week because I was diving into this. It just, it just kept flooring me what I was reading. There's a, there's a website, it's called Covenant Eyes. They actually track statistics as it relates to pornography among believers and non-believers. But understand this, 90% of teens and 96% of young adults are either encouraging, accepting, or neutral when talking to their friends about porn. Let me tell you what the world has taught our kids. It's normal and it's acceptable. Okay, and, and, and I know what you all think. Not our kids. Let me just say that's what everybody thinks. Okay. It's not surprising though when only 55% of adults, 25 and older, view pornography to be wrong. That's almost half our country doesn't view it as wrong. Do you understand the importance of not conforming to the world? When the world says this is okay? This one, this one about made me, <laughs> I don't know. Teens and young adults believe not recycling is worse than viewing porn. It's sad. It's sad. 51% of males, 32% of females have already viewed pornographic images before their 13th birthday. Let's not pretend it's not out there. Let's not pretend it can't be in here. 11 year olds, 12 year olds, It takes about five seconds on an iPhone to get to this stuff. And it doesn't take a credit card. They don't have to pay for it. It's free. And let me just tell you this. One of the other interesting things I found out this week, the new VR technology that's come out. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Virtual reality technology. You know, you put the goggles on and you can, it makes you actually feel, oh, she's not here. I was going to have, (laughs) <laughs> Wasn't it Janet that tried the VR thing? Yeah, they were trying to walk across a plank. And anyway, right? Um, it's estimated that the porn industry is backing the VR industry to the tune of almost $50 billion a year. And they expect revenues from VR porn to exceed revenues from the NFL. Think about that for a minute. We have to take extreme measures. 71% of kids successfully hide their online activities from their parents. I'm not going to make any friends with the kids right now. Okay? But I'm not going to apologize to you either. Parents, if you pay for your kid's phone, their internet, their computer, you have every right to see everything on their phone at any time, period. And if you're not looking often, you should be. You should be. And let me add, spouses, you have the right to see everything on your spouse's phone at any time any time without question 
Unless you have a receipt for their birthday present or something in there you don't want them to find. But you, you understand what I'm saying, okay? You say, why does all this matter? It matters because God says porn, lust, it's sinful. Because it degrades and devalues and uses people. Consider, consider you want to know how these two are tied together? Right? You know, Jesus talks about lust and he talks about marriage. Look at the statistics. 70% of divorce cases involve one party meeting a new lover. Where? Online. On the internet. 70%. That's a huge number. But listen to this one. Almost 60% of divorced couples report at least one spouse in the marriage with an obsessive interest in porn sites. You want to cut divorce rate down by 60%? Cut porn out. It's there. It's there. It's in our faces. But even more so, look at this one. 70% of women who have divorced over the porn addiction of their spouse suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD. It's violent. It's not harmless it's not, it's not, well, it's just me by myself. Nobody else is affected. That's so wrong. Yes, you are affected. And I could give you more and more and more statistics that I don't even want to share in here. And if you've got questions, come ask me. There's medical issue arising in teenagers that have never even been seen before as a result of porn. It's crazy. And Satan is winning this war. We've created a whole society as well as a multi-billion dollar industry that thinks that people are simply there to fulfill our desires. And we as a nation are spending $3 billion a year to kill our marriages and degrade people as objects. We've created a world where if a spouse doesn't fulfill my needs anymore, I'll just throw them away and go get a new one. I'll find one who is meeting my needs. But Jesus calls us to a different view of the world where people are loved, not used. All people where faithfulness is deep and powerful. It's a characteristic of our lives and it's a characteristic of our marriages. Now I know, I'll be the, I know you can't help but admire a beautiful woman or a handsome man. I'm telling you what, the rock walks in this room, my wife's head's gonna break off. She, she's gonna spin right around, right? I mean, you can't help recognize beauty. You can't help recognize attractiveness. And let me just say, because you recognize the beauty of another does not mean you've lusted. Okay? We're not talking about putting blinders on. But then when that, when that look lingers and it becomes willful in its intent to satisfy something in me, then yes, it becomes lust. If you've been to the beach, you've seen this. Right? You've seen the girls walking down the beach and you've seen this guy who literally falls out of his chair because his head just, you know, he just follows them everywhere, right? You've seen this take place. You want to know how to define lust. It's when whatever is in your mind, if you say, you know what? I wish I could blank when looking at someone. If that blank is sinful, then yes, you've lusted. You've already committed whatever you just wished you could do in your heart. And Jesus says that's so wrong because it just simply objectifies another human being for your own need. And that's totally contrary to Jesus' kingdom. Can you imagine a world where we put that away? Where we really loved people with integrity for who they are and we stopped using them just for what we could get out of them. You know, how is it that one of God's greatest gifts of love, human sexuality, has gone so wrong? It's everywhere. You know, we can blame technology for it. Sex is now available anytime, anywhere, anyplace, anonymously. But long before the internet, human beings were still struggling with this. Even in the times in which Jesus lived, no internet, no TV, no cell phones, none of this stuff, it was a problem. He knew that he knew that sexuality had the capacity of being perverted by man and it was being so. But just like we've talked about with anger and just like we've talked about with hypocrisy, the only change that has to take place has to take place from the inside out. It has to start in here at the heart. One of the ways in which we protect and cleanse our hearts is by keeping watch over what we put into it. You know, when I first started in in high school, I was in a computer programming class, one of the very first ones they ever offered because I had 
Yeah, that's how old I am. It was like the first computers, right? And, and, and we lived off of a principle in programming them, and you've all heard it, right? Garbage in, garbage out. Let me tell you something, church. If you continue to put garbage into your heart, guess what's going to come out of your heart? Garbage. And let me just say this. There's a whole lot of garbage out there in the world that's being fed into us. And let me just add one more thing really quick. Pornography doesn't just exist in pictures. It's also in words. Don't, do not be misguided into believing that just because the book you're looking at has no pictures, there's no pornography in it. If the images described by words are causing you to wish or, or think or to fantasize, then it's just as much pornography if it was laid out there on a, uh, as a picture. Just another one of Satan's tools to make us think, oh, well, that's not so bad. They're just words, right? Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. The biggest fallacy ever uttered. Words can kill you. You know, Job might very well be the oldest book of the Bible ever written. Some scholars predated even before Moses penned the Pentateuch, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Oldest book on record that we know of, and listen to what Job says in verse chapter 31. He said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? The oldest known book we have in the Bible, we find a guy who has taken extreme measures to protect himself from lust. If it's been going on for that long, do we think we're so immune? Before TV, before movies, before porn, before the internet, even he had to be proactive to keep himself pure. You can't fill your life with images that create lust and expect to remain pure. It can't happen. Pro be proactive. Take your computer, put it right in the middle of the living room. Right? But ultimately, lust can be solved only from the inside out. We have to change the way we look at the world. We have to change the way we look at people. We have to change our hearts. Because understand, gouging out an eye or cutting off a hand won't change your heart. You're just being a one-eyed, one-handed luster. It won't change your heart, right? I mean, I'm serious. And you think, oh, okay, that didn't work, so I'll pluck out the other eye and cut off the other hand. You'll find a way. If you don't change your heart, you will find a way. And what is it? The heart of lust, of adultery, is simply that we use another person as a means for our own gratification. In other words, the heart of all sexual sin is simple. It's selfishness. And that's the sin that Jesus says has to be cut out at the root. The Apostle Paul sums up the values I think that Jesus wants us to have. And, and ask yourself this, how can you engage in lust? How can you engage in pornography? How can you engage in those sexual sins and do this do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. I would pose, there's absolutely no way you can fulfill this verse and lust. Because you, in lusting, are only fulfilling your own desires and you're not considering the other person. Church, we have to begin to see people, all people, as fellow human beings created in the image of God himself, as people worthy of respect, worthy of dignity, not as simple objects to be used to fulfill our own desires. We know our hearts have changed when we begin to see people like God sees people. This week, my wife posted a little thing on Facebook and it was a little character with a, thing is kind of said what would Jesus do I think and, and you know what that, that gets thrown around a lot and and I, I, I understand the, the intent behind it we ask the question what would Jesus do and, and you know what in this case it's a great thing to ask 
You see someone who's beautiful, you see someone who's attractive, and your mind automatically starts to go someplace it shouldn't go. Ask yourself, well, how would Jesus look at her? How would Jesus look at him? And, and then have the conversation with Jesus, not yourself. Would Jesus treat them that way? Would Jesus allow his thoughts to go there? Would Jesus seek his own benefit? But you know, the bigger question is most of us, especially in here, most of us know what Jesus would do. And that's really not the question we have to ask. The question we got to be asking ourselves is this. I know what Jesus would do. Now, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? This morning, I, I understand a, a lot of what we've talked about maybe touching you. Now, some of the statistics I read said that even within the church, 40% of you struggle with porn. I, I'm not saying you. I'm talking about globally. Okay, 40%. I'll, I'll talk about my profession. One out of seven ministers struggle with porn addiction. One out of five youth ministers struggle with porn addiction. I'm not talking about something that's not real. I'm not talking about something that just affects somebody else. Okay? They wouldn't be making billions of dollars off of it and investing more money into it. Someone's, one of the statistics I read said that almost $28,000 per second is spent on the development or purchase of pornography. Think about that for a minute. And let me just say this. If it's a struggle for you, God knows that. Jesus knows that. And you can be forgiven of that. But you have to make a choice to want to. You got to quit believing the lie that it's all okay and that nobody's hurt and that, and that no, no one's going to be affected because they are and you are. We're going to sing a song if you need help with this. And I, and I know, just like I said last week, I, I preach a sermon like this on, on sexuality or sexual sin. We offer the invitation and everybody just hangs onto their chair for dear life. It's like, I ain't going down there for nothing. I get that. I get that. But I hope you understand that you don't have to walk down here to make a change in your life. And I hope you understand that your shepherds, Daryl, Herb, Eric, Paul, they are available to you 24-7, 365. And if you need to call them and say, you know what, I struggle with this. I was too embarrassed to walk down front, but I need you to help me on this. Then do that. You can call me. You can call Dana. Ladies, and let me just say something real right off the bat. Pornography is not just a male issue. Matter of fact, almost 40% of the people who buy it are female now. Okay. It's so important. All I'm saying is you have access to help. We're not here to judge. We're here to help. We'll walk with you through it as best we can. We've got to take extreme measures, folks. Our marriages are worth it. Our lives are worth it. Our purity is worth it. Our kids are worth it. So let's do what we need to do. If you need that, please know it's available to you. But also understand this. If you're ready to commit yourself to the kingdom of Christ today, if you're ready to put him on in baptism, then be ready to be transformed because you cannot live in the kingdom of Christ and still conform to the world. It's not possible. However we can help you today, please just let us know as we stand, as we sing. Eric.